doing that intercession on our behalf that we might be able to have a day to walk in your presence and then a next day and then a next day. Father, we are grateful for Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the sacrifice that he did on the cross of Calvary for the blood that was shed, for the body that was slain, that was laid in the grave. And we're so grateful that three days later he rose from the dead. Shows that sin and death has been defeated. And we have a life because he lives. Pray that each one here today live that life to glorify Christ. Live that life to honor Christ, to, to, to lift him up and to, to praise his name and to tell others about him. Father, now as we come to the worship part where we read your word and we listen to the exaltation of it, Lord, let us in our hearts be tuned towards you. May we be open to the words you're going to tell us. May you speak through Herman to us for your glory. May you lift us up and reveal something about your nature. We ask all of this in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you be seated? Of course, I said Herman's going to come on up and he'll deliver the word for us. So, Herman. What a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate you and your faithfulness. You've heard me say many times that we were here that your presence is an honor and a blessing. You have honored the Lord by being in his house this morning. Uh, any one of you could have stayed at home, but you chose to be in God's house, and you have honored him with your presence. And then your presence is a blessing, because if you were not here, your place would be empty, but because you are here, you're a blessing to all of us around you. So thank you for choosing to be in God's house. I appreciate the, the blessing to be here today. I know that we were planning on starting revival. Everything kind of turned upside down. This has been some remarkable year. Uh, but the good thing is God's still in charge. Amen. Right. And we praise Him. We are still traveling every week. Uh, last week we were north of Temple. Uh, just came back Wednesday night. Uh, we'll be leaving this coming weekend. Uh, going back to Colleen and be sharing the revival there. And then from there we'll be going back over to Byron be sharing over there and so God continues to open the door but we just had to make a lot of adjustments this year uh, but that's all right God is still good and we just praise his holy name so we thank you so much uh, for being here today if you have your Bible today I want you to turn with me in a scripture uh, one that you're very familiar with and that's in the book of Ezekiel if you remember the book of Ezekiel in the 22nd chapter, uh, one verse, and that's verse 30, it says this. He says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, and that I should not destroy it. But I found none. What a tremendous verse. You remember preceding this, it said that, Prophets were simply saying, God said this, God said that, when God really hadn't said anything. And then he comes back to this verse right here. And he says, I'm looking for a man, just a man, that's willing to stand in the gap. But he said, I found none. And I thought about that. What kind of a man is God looking for? Now, when I say man, I want to say that I include women into that. Uh, narrative as well. What kind of a person is God looking for that God would use in order to stand in the gap so that the land would not be destroyed? I believe that God's looking for that person today. I believe that God is looking for people in our churches, in our communities, in our families, in our schools, in our government, wherever it may be, men and women that are willing to be the person that God wants. Person is that person that God's looking for. I'm going to give you three things that I believe that God's looking for. The first thing that I want to mention is found in 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. And you remember in the 16th chapter, this is a familiar chapter to most of us here today because it's a story of little David. You remember that? The calling of little David. God's looking for a king. 
And he sends down looking for the king. And notice what it says here in verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not upon his countenance, nor upon the height of his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. And we remember the passage of Scripture this pertains to. Samuel goes down looking for God's king, and all of a sudden he comes to Jesse's house, and and Jesse brings all of his sons before Samuel, knowing surely that God was going to pick one of those sons. But one by one, they passed by. Samuel said, not him, not him, not him, not him. Till he comes down to the last one, and finally he says to Jesse, he said, is this all of your sons? And notice what Jesse said in verse 11. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is the keeper of the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes in. And you remember, they went after little David, they brought him, and all of a sudden God said, This is him. What was it about little David? I've said many times in youth groups, when you talk about little David, you're talking about a lot of young people as well that feel the same way. Notice what he said. First of all, David's daddy said, he said there remains one. In other words, David's not even included in the group. Surely if God is going to look for somebody, God's not going to look for somebody like little David. I mean, surely not David. You know, there's people today that feel that same way. They just feel like there's some way, somehow, that they just don't fit in. And that if God is going to pick somebody, God surely is not going to pick them. Because they're not important. As a matter of fact, they're just left out, out there in the middle of nowhere. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that sometimes, some way, that God could use somebody, but surely God couldn't use you? Maybe because of some mistake that you made in your life. Maybe because of some situation that you faced. That God is not going to choose you. That you're not important. But notice what Jesse's daddy also said. Not only, not only he's not here, but he's the youngest. In other words, if God's going to pick somebody, God's not going to pick David because David's the youngest of all of the boys. Have you ever felt like sometimes that your age would hinder God using you. You know, I, I, I love to speak, and I'm there, but I love to speak to senior adults because I love to remind them that Moses wasn't called to the ministry until he was 80 years old. Isn't that amazing? Caleb at 85 stands there and says, listen, I, I want my mountain. At 85, Caleb still believed that God was going to use him. Jesse said, surely God's not going to pick David because he's the youngest. You see, I'm going to say to you today, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. God has a purpose for your life. And notice what Jesse also said. He's a keeper of the sheep. In other words, he don't have any ability. I mean, he ain't nothing but a shepherd boy. Surely, if God's going to pick somebody, God's not going to pick David because David doesn't have any ability. You see how many times have you and I faced that? Felt like that God couldn't use us because maybe we wasn't the most talented, the most gifted person in the world. See, David must have felt that way. He wasn't even included. He was the youngest. He was just a shepherd boy. But here's the thing that I want you to notice. God wasn't looking at the outward appearance. God was looking at the heart. That's right. And David had a heart that was turned towards God. That's, right. That's the person God's looking for. God's just looking for a person that that just wants more of God. I think one, here's a, here's a great, great verse, if, if 
I can find it real quickly here. But in the book of Acts, it said this. It said this about David. It said in chapter 13, verse 22. And when he removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Now notice. To whom also he gave testimony, saying, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Did you notice why God picked David? Because David had a heart after God. And not only that, but God said, I give unto him a testimony. I wonder what kind of a testimony God would give us today. God's looking for somebody. Somebody that's willing to make a difference, whether it be in church, or whether it be in community, or whether it be in family, or whether it be in school, or wherever it may be. God's looking for that person. But when God looks at you and me, what does he see? Does he just see a person with excuses? Well, God, you know, surely you don't want me, God. I mean, as a matter of fact, I don't have any ability. God, you're not looking at me because, God, I'm always in the shadow. Everybody's always in front of me. God, you're not looking at me because look at my age, God. Surely you would want me. But you see, God's not looking at the outward appearance. God is looking at the heart. Regardless how young, regardless how old you are, you can make a difference if your heart is right. Towards God. Noah was that kind of man. You remember the story of Noah. I mean in a world that God was going to destroy. The Bible said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why did he find grace in the eyes of the Lord? The Bible simply says because he was a man that walked with God. He was a man that made a difference. David was that kind of man. You remember David as he had, I mean, Daniel, when he had all of the pressure put on him. You remember what happened? He said, I'm not going to bow to pressure. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to continue morning, noon, and evening. Turn my face towards God. That's the kind of person that God's looking for. Paul was that kind of a man. Later on in Paul's life, he wrote this. He said, oh, you want to talk about Gaining, he said, I had this and I had that. I had education. I came from the elite of the elite. I was religious. I kept it down to every jot and tittle. But he said, I want you to know that everything that I once had, I count as nothing. Rubbish to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right, that's right. He says, forgetting those things which are behind, pressing on to those things which are before. He said, my life is consumed with one thing. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the kind of person God's looking for. God is a, looking for a person that's just willing to turn their heart and their life towards him. Regardless of who you are. God's looking for a person. A person. Not judging by the outward appearance, but by the heart of a man. The second thing that I thought about is God's looking for someone that's willing to be a watchman. You notice in that verse in, in, in the book of Ezekiel, he said, I was looking for a man to, to stand in the camp. I found none. But if you go on and read over in, in, in Ezekiel 30, what is it, 36, uh, 33 it is, uh, the Bible begins to talk about a watchman. God's looking for a watchman to set over the city. But notice what God says about the watchman. He said, you've been entrusted with the trumpet. But, in verse 6 of 33, he said, but if the watchman see the sword come, blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, and the sword come and take every person from them, he that taketh away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, o son of man, I have set thee a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the words of my mouth and warn them from me. I was looking for a watchman. You see the amazing truth. 
We're all watchers. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sin, but has committed them to what? The ministry of reconciliation. So therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Every one of us that are born again are watchers with the entrusted word of God to warn the wicked and the lost. That's the person God's looking for. That's looking for somebody that's faithful. Somebody that's willing to blow the trumpet. Somebody that's willing to share the message to those that are lost without a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of a watchman are we? You know, it's an amazing thing that the Bible says. That if we blow not the trumpet and warn the wicked, they'll die. But they'll die in their iniquity. But their blood will be required upon our hands. You know, I've said from this pulpit right here. I mean, when I was a pastor, I would ask my people, I'd say, why are we here? Why are we here? Why, why is this church here? I could ask you the same question. Why is this church here? Is it just to be here on this corner? Is it here just in order to have a steeple over his, his roof? Is it here just in order to have First Baptist Church over his name? Why are we here? We're here because at one time, in the heart of one individual, someplace, there was a vision for it, that our church, this church, was to be established in this community to be a what? A lighthouse to those that are lost without Christ. And when we lose that vision, when we lose that message, we lose the very purpose of our existence of why we're here. That's the person God's looking for. I was looking for somebody to be a spokesman, somebody to blow the trumpet, somebody that's willing to stand in the gap and to warn the wicked that there's a judgment coming. Are we that people? Are we that church? Are we blowing the trumpet? Are we getting the message outside of the walls of our churches? Because my friend, one day, you and I will give an account to God for those that were lost around us. I'm one of those that believe with all of my heart that the lost people will not give an account for not coming to church. God will not say to the lost person, listen, you lived a block from the church and you never darkened the church's door and you never went to listen to a single message. You never stood at an invitation. You never responded to the gospel. God's not going to say that to a lost person. It's not their responsibility to come to us. It's our responsibility to go to them. We are the watchmen. We are the ones to blow the trumpet and to warn them that day is approaching. God's looking for a watchman. God's looking for a person whose heart is turned towards him. Let me give you the last one. God is looking for a person that's willing to be faithful. Willing to be faithful. There's a scripture in the Bible, in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 1, it says this. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards, stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You know what that means? That just simply means that God has entrusted into you and into me and that which God has given us that we are to be good stewards of it. Everything that we have is a blessing from God. I've heard it through the years. I've heard people say, well, 
Preacher, I want to tell you something. I made what I got. Who gave you the ability to make that? Who opened your eyes in the morning so that you could face another day? Who gave you the strength to get up and to do what you did? God did. God gave you that ability. The Bible says that we're to be good stewards in that. And I believe that falls under that category, first of all, is our life. God's given us life. And we're to be good stewards of that life. And we're to live that life pleasing unto God. As I said with you last year when we were here. At Judeo when she passed away. Out of all the things that we had in our house. All the things that she loved and all of that. When we left that Monday morning to go to Houston. She never knew that she would never come back to that home. Everything she had. She left behind. Except for one thing. And that was what she had done with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's eternal. That's why Jesus said, lay not your treasures on earth where moss and rust and dust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay your treasures in heaven. Why? Because the only thing that's going to be eternal in your life and in my life is that which we've done with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be a good steward. We need to live our life to honor Him. I don't believe that it ends with just life. I believe that it moves into the family. I just got out of a revival this past week where every message was centered around the family. They asked it. They said, Brother Herman, we want you to come. We want you to share a revival, but we want every message centered upon the family. And one of the things that I brought out in those sermons was simply this, that the most important possession that you have is your family apart from your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The family is important. I mean, when God created man, God looked at man and said, it's not good that man be made alone. And out of man, God created woman. And for the very first time, he looked at his creation and he said, it is very good. Before God had anything else, before God instigated the church, God created the family. He says, go and multiply and replenish the earth. God loves the family. We need to be good stewards of the family. I believe that we're living in a crossroads of our family. I believe that. And my friend, we're living in a, in a day that there is, there is more strife and hatred and division and, and things that are happening that you and I have never seen in our lifetime. But I stand before you to say this today. That America will not rise and fall who's in the White House. It will not rise and fall on our military. It will not rise and fall upon how much money we have in the Treasury. But America will only be as great as the families that are in America. And when the family turns against God, everything else will fall apart. Right. We need to be good stewards of our family. And then lastly, we need to be good stewards in our service. Good stewards in our service. Now, folks, you're looking at somebody not because of who I am, but because of who God is. Now, I can tell you that we have traveled, flopped, flip-flopped across this state of ours over into Louisiana ever since the virus started. Churches after churches after churches after churches. And I understand. I understand. I, I've stood in churches and I, I would say this about Brother Keith and your staff here and those that, that work here. Thank God for pastors that have continued to get the message out even in the midst of the virus through Facebook and YouTube and all of that. Many of these pastors had never even had any idea how to do it all and just had to put it together in order to get it out. And more people are hearing the messages today than ever before. That's right. But let me tell you the danger. The danger is a lot of Christians are getting satisfied with it outside the church right. than they were inside. It's a whole lot easier to get up on Sunday morning and just do your normal activity and then just curl up on the couch, turn on the television, watch your church. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. God didn't intend it to be that way. God intended for us to come together 
as God's people. We need the fellowship. We need the togetherness. We need to be as a body. And I believe that one of the greatest hindrances that we're going to face through this virus is there's going to be a lot of Christians, a lot of good Christians, that are going to become indifferent to the church. Feel like that they don't need the church. But the church is not important. My friend, the church is vitally important. And I thank God for you. I thank God for you that are here today. But I pray for those that my friend feel like that it's not necessary to be here today. And I know that there's circumstances, and I'm one of those that will be the first to say it. I realize the elderly people and those that, that, that are very uh, likable to the virus and things like that, they don't need to be in church. But my friend, I want to tell you, just because the virus comes doesn't relieve our responsibility to serve God as God has called us to serve. There is plenty of opportunity. There's plenty of doors. There's plenty of ways that you and I can serve God, even in the midst of this. And so we need to be a good steward. We need to ask God, what is it, God, that you want me to do? See, the question this morning is simply this. Are you that person that God's looking for? Are you that person that has a heart turned towards him? Are you that person that is willing to be a watchman? Or are you that person that's willing to be faithful with what God has given you? That's what God's looking for this morning. People like you and like me. I've shared our testimony here many, many times. I told you. When God called me, he just called the country boy. A foreign boy down in the Rigland Valley. Didn't even like high school. Certainly never dark in college. But you see, God chose me. Not because of who I was, but because of who he was. It's not about what I can do. It's about what God can do when we turn our hearts towards him. And God may be looking for you to make that difference. Would you be that person today? Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. I don't know. Maybe you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe today would be that day. If you could invite Jesus to come into your heart, we'll be speaking about that in the next service in a completely different message altogether. But maybe you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ your personal Savior. Today would be a good, good day for you to turn your heart towards Him. Maybe today you attend here, you worship here, you love it here, but you've never joined here. This church needs you. You need this church. Maybe today you'd want to come and say, Brother Keith, this is where God's led us. This is where we want to be. This is where we want to serve God. Maybe you need to come today and make that decision in life. Or maybe just rededicate your life. Maybe that's what God wants you to do. Maybe your heart's not where it ought to be. Maybe your uh, uh, faithfulness is not where it ought to be. Maybe today you're not the watchman that you ought to be. But you can be. Just as old as God wants you. Will you respond? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for the simplicity of your word. And God, I, I, I'm grateful and so thankful that God, that you not look at the outward appearance of man, but God, that you look at the heart. That God, that, that you're just looking for people that have a heart turned towards you loves you with all of their heart and their soul and mind. God just willing to just be everything for you. God, if that person in this room today, I pray today that God, that you would just encourage them. That God, that you would let them know that God, that they're important. That God, that they can make a difference. God, if there's somebody here that's not saved, I pray today that they would give their heart to you. God, if there's somebody that needs a church home, today would be that day that they would come. So, God, this is your place, your time, your people. Speak to us, God. Give us courage to respond. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to sing an invitation, Brother Keith, to be standing here. We're going to invite you to come. If God's asking you to make a decision, uh, we're going to ask you to come and make that decision. Let's pray.